good to see you. Nice to meet you. Come Here on. Here you are. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you. I'm not a. <clears throat> I'm not very familiar with Seattle. Brian Brown. Nice, nice to, meet to meet you. you. How, How are you doing? This is my husband Terry. Terry. Hi. Nice, nice to, to meet you, Brian Brown. Brian Brown. This is our son, Jim. Oh, did you? Really? What are you up here? I actually told you to cleanse the house of the Catholic kids, lest you think it was kitsch or insulting. That belonged to my grandfather. Uh, every, all the rosaries are my... Uh, Who, who's on me? Just, just chat. Just chat. Okay. Just be chat. All right, we're gone. Um, okay, so this is the, the dinner table debate. Um, I'm Mark Oppenheimer. I write for the New York Times. I write the beliefs column. Uh, who are you? I'm Dan Savage. I write Savage Love and run my mouth and run myself into ditches sometimes running my mouth. Who are you? Brian Brown, president of the National Organization for Marriage. Okay, so just to be clear of why we're here, uh, back in April, April 2012, today's August 15th, uh, Dan spoke at a high school at the National High School Journalism Convention, and he said, and there's some ellipses in here. This, I've cut out some things, but I think I've been true to the spirit of it. He said, we can learn to ignore the bull, the original word was longer, but <laughs> we can learn to ignore the bull in the Bible about gay people the same way we learn to ignore the bull in the Bible about shellfish, about slavery, about dinner, about farming, about menstruation, about virginity, about masturbation, etc. We can ignore what the Bible says about slaves because the Bible got slavery wrong. And that was a piece of what you said back in April. And some students walked out. The majority stayed, but a, you know, a dozen or two, it seemed, walked out. I wasn't there. Brian wasn't there. But some walked out. And then in the days following, many critics attacked Dan for, being, um, for having attacked the Bible and attacked Christianity in the presence of, of these, these high school kids. About a week later, Brian Brown, wrote, was it on your blog? Because it was too long for a tweet. Yeah, it was on the blog and, in, and I think also in an email. It was on the blog and email to whom? To all of our supporters. To all your supporters. Okay. But not to me. But not to Dan. Well, I don't know that I had your email at hey, the time, okay, but okay. I do now. He said, <laughs> he said, let me lay down a public challenge to Dan Savage right here and now. You want to savage the Bible, Christian morality, traditional marriage, Pope Benedict, I'm here. You name the time and place, and let's see what a big man you are with someone you can talk back. Ellipses. You will find out how venal and ridiculous your views of these things are if you dare to accept a challenge. Is that about right? Okay. And then later in May, again, we're talking about three, four months ago, in your podcast, Dan, you said, I accept that challenge. And I'll you said, tell me where and when. You said, my living room, although we're actually in your dining room. Did I say living room? I, where did you, what did you say? Dining room? Dining room. Okay. He said, name the time and place. I said, so, my house after dinner. And he, you kindly invited me as a veteran of these, uh, of these culture wars to, to moderate. And I was grateful that, that Brian was willing to have me as a moderator. And your neighbor, John Colwell, a fine Seattle area uh, chef to his four children, uh, cooked us some fine meals. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take about an hour. And I said that since you were the one who... You challenged him to say those things, to be a big man and say those things in your presence. I want to let him say those things. Based on that challenge, he gets to go first. And I'm going to give him a dozen to 15 minutes or so. We're not going to be fascistic about this. To, to, to reiterate what it is that you felt uh, that you were trying to communicate about, um, about the Bible and about Christianity or religion more broadly and, and gay people. And then you're going to get to reply at about the same length. And I'll be the judge of that. And then uh, we're going to have a conversation. So you're gonna, you'll cut me off when I'm done? I will cut you off, exactly. Oh, okay, when so I don't need to when you, don't set even a worry timer? When, you, when you're being a motor mouth, I'm gonna cut you off. I'm a motor mouth all the time. Okay, I'm gonna cut you off. So Dan, <laughs> Sa Dan Savage, take it away. Okay, you suggested that the title for the debate should be Christianity is bad for LGBT Americans. I said if we were doing high school debate as I once participated and coached, the topic would be something like, be it resolved, Christianity is bad for LGBTQ Americans. And, and my response to that is Christianity doesn't have to be bad for LGBTQ Americans. And I think that that frame implicitly uh, accepts the premise, one of, the, I think, the two big lies, the two big false dichotomies promoted by your side of this debate. Um, and that is that uh, there are gay people and there are Christians and they're at war. Um, when the actual fact is that the overwhelming majority of LGBTQ Americans are Christians, or like me, were raised uh, in Christian families and come from Christian faith backgrounds. Uh, you know, Eugene Robinson and Father Michael Judge spring immediately to mind as examples of openly gay American Christians. Um, the other big false lie, I think, false dichotomy that your side promotes is that you're either a supporter of traditional marriage, a savager of traditional marriage, or a supporter of marriage equality, when you can actually, I think, be a supporter of both. I am a rabid supporter of my siblings' traditional marriages, of my families, of my friends, my neighbors' traditional marriages. John Colwell and his wife, Mishi Cass, 
uh, who made dinner tonight, I support their traditional marriage. It's not an either or choice. Um, we're here because of the Bible and my big mouth uh, and that speech to a high school journalism conference where I was invited to give the same speech I give at colleges and have given frequently and they told me to pull no punches and I didn't have to moderate my usual tone and they certainly knew who I was when they invited me. There were 3,000 kids at that speech, 3,000 high school students uh, who had been warned that I shoot my mouth off and sometimes uh, touch on taboo topics. Um, 24 walked out of 3,000. The 3,000, the 2,900 plus who stayed, the overwhelming majority were Christians. There wasn't 3,000 Zoroastrian American high school students who stayed for the rest of the speech. Um, it was wrong of me in that uh, those remarks to describe the walkout, the reaction as pansy ass. That was name calling, and I apologized for that. Um, uh, and, and it was wrong of me. I also, if you watch the whole tape that was put up. At the end of that tape, I apologize if I may have offended the kids who left and invite them back in for the rest of the speech. Um, I did say that there is bullshit in the Bible, uh, and for that I have not apologized and I will not apologize. Uh, bullshit means untrue words or ideas. Uh, there's this Mark Twain quote that I love that I'm going to read. Uh, it is full of interest, he says of the Bible. It has noble poetry in it, some clever fables, some blood-drenched history, some good morals, a wealth of obscenity, and upwards of a thousand lies which is 19th century Mark Twain saying bullshit in the Bible. Um, was I bullying? The Economist says no. Uh, bullying is a strong picking on the weak, not the other way around. The other way around is satire. Um, I won't read that whole quote, but they go on to unpack why I wasn't bullying, and I don't believe I was bullying either. Um, Brian challenged us to a debate about the Bible, and I'd like to address some things in the Bible, if that's okay with Mr. Moderator. It is okay. Um, you know, I'm from a Catholic background. My dad was a Catholic deacon. Uh, my mom was a Catholic lay minister. I attended a seminary for a couple of years, a preparatory seminary, a high school seminary. Um, I'm not unfamiliar with the Christian Bible or the Christian tradition or the Catholic tradition. Um, there are two, uh, you know, in the beginning, let's begin with the beginning of the Bible, uh, you get two conflicting and contradictory creation narratives right off the bat. Chapter 1 of Genesis and chapter 2 of Genesis, most biblical scholars believe are two uh, different creation narratives that have just been piggybacked together or set side by side. Most people read them uncritically uh, and don't notice that everything's created in a different order and for a different reason. At the end of the first uh, creation narrative in Genesis, uh, God creates humankind, not Adam and Eve, but humanity itself created in our image, male and female, he created them, plural. Um, and then chapter 2 of Genesis, uh, a couple of verses in, it all starts over again. We have the, another creation narrative. And everything's created for a different reason, in a different order. Um, man is created first and placed in what must have been a very depressing garden because God had yet, not yet created plants. He places man in a garden and then creates plants. Um, and then God says, uh, it is not good for man to be alone. Um, and his response uh, to that dilemma for man is not to create woman, not yet, um, it is to create animals. And he brings the animals to Adam, he names them. Um, Adam has some agency and some choice here. He's allowed to express a preference. Uh, and he rejects all of these animals as potential partners, so God creates Eve. Um, and why does he create Eve? To create a co-parent for Adam? Um, no, to create a partner for Adam, because it is not good for man to be alone. The message of Eve before they get down to the uh, being fruitful and multiplying is the original purpose of Eve is companionship, um, because it's not good for man to be alone. The contradictions uh, and, and of course, both of these stories, creation narratives, can't be literally true. I think if you're a, a Christian who believes uh, that the Bible is literally true, the inner word of God, here is God telling you in the first three pages that you can't take these, what comes next, literally, because there's a contradiction here and a massive one. Um, that was my father's interpretation of the first two books of Genesis. As God opens with, uh, here are two beautiful stories, you have to work out the meanings. Obviously, you can't take the Bible literally word for word. Um, the contradictions continue, thou shalt not kill. The Israelites spend a whole lot of time killing people on God's orders. Uh, Jesus says the old law must be followed. Paul contradicts him. Um, the one place, and this is what I said that was so controversial at the journalism conference, where there isn't really a conflict in the Bible is slavery. Um, Leviticus 25, 44 to 46, as for your male and female slaves whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from the nations that are around you, they may be your property, you may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. 
Uh, in the New Testament, Timothy, let all who are under the yoke of slavery regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be defamed. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching which accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit, he knows nothing. This is a verse that was thrown in the face of American abolitionists uh, before and during the, second, or the Civil War. Um, the Reverend Richard Fuller, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, in the years before the Civil War was able to say, with a straight face, and because it's true, what God has sanctioned in the Old Testament and permitted in the New cannot be a sin. Um, like I said to the high school journalism student, Sam Harris in his book, Letter to a Christian Nation, uh, says the Bible got the easiest moral question that humanity has ever faced wrong, and that was slavery. Um, and my add-on, my point was that the Bible, if it got something as easy and obvious as slavery wrong, what are the odds that the Bible got something as complicated as human sexuality wrong? I put those odds at about 100%. Um, Pat Robertson was recently asked about this. Uh, I don't know if you saw that clip um, on the, his show. Uh, he was asked, if America was founded as a Christian nation, why do we allow slavery? And his answer was, like it or not, if you read the Bible, in the Old Testament, slavery is permitted. That's, not, that's a half-truth. In both Testaments, slavery is permitted and sanctioned. But then Robertson said something um, uncharacteristically profound. We have moved in our conception of the value of human beings until we realized that slavery was terribly wrong. And so what he's saying there is not just that we realized slavery was terribly wrong, also that we realized the Bible was wrong about slavery. Um, I don't think LGBT Americans are asking uh, American Christians to do anything that you haven't already done. Um, move in your conception of the value of human beings. In this instance, human beings who happen to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgendered. Uh, many American Christians, we know you can move because many American Christians have already moved in their value of the conception of human beings because many American Christians, including a majority of American Catholics, uh, support uh, marriage rights for, LG, for uh, support same-sex, rights for same-sex couples. Um, not a majority for marriage, but a majority for either civil unions, all incidents of marriage, and or marriage. Um, I don't think support for our full civil equality until requires fundamentalist or evangelical Christians or Catholics or anyone else to change their theology, to change their perspective uh, on uh, the morality of what it means to be gay, just to sign off uh, on our full civil equality. Tolerate doesn't mean celebrate. Tolerate means uh, endure or put up with. And I think that Christians, uh, conservative Christians, can learn to tolerate legal, civil, uh, same-sex marriage the way they've learned to tolerate legal divorce, which violates Catholic teaching, uh, interfaith marriages, and non-religious marriages. Um, you know, John Shore, who's a, ca a Christian blogger, uh, a pro-gay marriage Christian blogger and author, he says that the Bible has no place in a conversation about the legality or illegality of gay marriage. Illegal uh, is not a religious term. In a pluralistic society, you know, people are free to relive their religious values. And I believe people are free to proselytize. Um, if somebody wants to talk me out of my marriage to Terry, I think that they should knock themselves out. I don't think that they have a right uh, to use the law to do that, to deny us equal protection under the law because of their interpretation of the Bible uh, or their interpretation of God's will. Um, imposing your interpretation of the Bible on someone else is not religious freedom as you've attempted to redefine it. That is religious tyranny. Brian, you want to? He left some time on the he table. Left some time on the, well, I actually have more. I'm he happy took about, to, I'm happy to run my mouth. He's about ten, took about ten minutes, but you want to? He's, he's throwing it to you. So do you want to? Actually, I have one more Bible thing. Can all I right, yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Um, We're all friends here. You know, returning to the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments. There's stuff in there uh, for straight people, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not be Newt Gingrich, in the new modern American translation it could be. Um, but there's also, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And I do feel that NAM and other... Uh, NAM being the National Organization for Marriage. marriage ...is in the bearing false witness business uh, and routinely bears false witness against your lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered neighbors. The conflation of homosexuality with pedophilia which uh, organizations like the Family Research Council has, have done explicitly. NOM tends to do it through linking and uh, through surrogates. Most recently, Reverend Willie Owens, a NOM religious liaison, uh, condemned gay marriage and suggested that support for gay marriage is the same as condoning child molestation. Uh, pardon me, child molestation. Um, but the one that really galls me personally as a parent is the uh, 
Regnerus study that you guys are promoting, um, that the Witherspoon Institute that uh, is linked to NAM um, funded at the two for the, you know for uh, three quarters of a million dollars. The claim is that this compared the outcome for children who are raised by same-sex couples with children who are raised by uh, traditional married couples, and that is that is a lie. Uh, the study has been. Uh, widely criticized. There were 248 kids in the study um, who were classed as having uh, gay or lesbian parents. Only two of those 248 kids were raised by a same-sex couple from birth. Um, that study's now been audited uh, by the journal that published it. The professor who, was, who conducted the audit has uh, praised Mark uh, Regnerus in the past, written letters of re recommendation for Mark Regnerus. He's not an enemy of Mark Regnerus. Um, and he concluded that the paper should never have been published because the study did not examine children of gay and lesbian parents. And what happens is, I think what Nam is doing is very much like the Tobacco Institute in the 70s and 80s. Um, studies of uh, same-sex parents have shown that our kids are as happy, healthy, well-adjusted as other people's children. And so now, through the Witherspoon Institute, they're beginning to fund their own studies. Uh, and getting the results that you want to get. And if that requires cooking the books and distorting, and potentially in the process destroying uh, this young scholar's career, um, because he's now being investigated by the University of Texas uh, for academic, um, I forget the word, uh, misconduct, and could get bounced. You know, here's a book from the American Psychological Association that runs through all the research into s families headed by same-sex couples and concludes that our kids are fine and there's this mountain of evidence. You weren't able to produce any evidence at the Prop 8 trials in California proving that our kids were in any way suffering or um, uh, harmed by having same-sex parents. And this bearing of false witness against same-sex families is potentially very dangerous, particularly the linking homosexual with pedophilia. 40% of homeless teenagers or LGBT kids who were thrown out of the house after they were outed or came out to their families. I've heard from scores of kids whose parents threw them out after they found out that they were gay because they were worried that their gay children would, were pedophiles who would molest their younger siblings. And that is a bit of poison that NAM and other organizations continue to inject into the culture. And real LGBT kids suffer and die as a result of that poison being injected into the culture. You know, I'm old enough do I have another minute you for one minutes. more point? Two, two minutes? minutes. Yep. <laughs> I am old enough to remember, because I am 47 years old, uh, Falwell and Anita Bryant back in the day. And the argument that my father believed and repeated to me when I was a child was that gay people were a threat to the family um, because we didn't marry, because we didn't have children, because we weren't invested in future generations, because we lived a purely hedonistic lifestyle uh, that was all about the next orgasm and wasn't about love and commitment and family. Um, and that was the slam from Falwell et al, was we were a threat to the family because we didn't marry, because we didn't have children. Uh, now somehow the goalposts are in an entire, not just move, they're in a new stadium where we are a threat to the family because we marry. We are a threat to the family because we have children. And it can't be both. We can't be a threat to the family when we model a life without commitment, a life without children, a life without um, an investment in the future, and a threat to the family when we marry or we have children, or we do commit to each other and commit to a future and commit to raising our children responsibly. My turn. Your turn. Uh, well, I don't know where to begin. I will, I will begin by uh, thanking Dan for opening up his house and having me. Uh, it was a great dinner earlier, and it was kind of you to have me in your home. You said you don't regularly do this in your home. I we imagine, I, I can't imagine why not. But um, actually, I can. I mean, it's, it's uh, obviously having cameras here and everything else. So thank you. You've been a very uh, gracious host. And we appreciate you accepting the invitation. Yeah, I was, I was glad to do it. As I, as I said, um, you know, this is an argument about public policy and about ideas. This is not an argument about us trying to hurt individuals. And hopefully, on your side, uh, folks not trying to hurt us. Uh, unfortunately, often that is what it has descended to today. Uh, we know there was a, a shooting at the Family Research Council. In my view, attempts to label the Family Research Council, as, as I think Dan just laid out, uh, maybe he didn't say the words, but to say that it's a hate group uh, or hateful 
because it has a different opinion about homosexuality and marriage, I think is profoundly wrong. I think it, it, it eats at the core of our civil discourse. And I think much of what Dan has just said uh, follows along these same lines. I don't know where to begin because we're all entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. And factually, you're simply wrong on a number of levels. Number one, when we talk about the Regnero study, uh, NOM did not fund the Regnero study at all because there are the board members that are board members of NOM and the Witherspoon Institute. That's often the case. I mean, if you looked at how many uh, Ford Foundation grants have been given out and look at the members of the Ford Foundation board and then look at other boards, to then make this giant quantum leap to say any other board that the Ford Foundation board members were a part of, they're responsible for the study. And somehow this means that there's something untoward happening is simply false, and people know that. Uh, as far as Regneros's study, uh, understand this, Regneros's study is the largest study of its kind ever done. The other studies that you point to here are snowball studies. Uh, what they attempt to do is to find uh, uh, s uh, homosexual parents, have the homosexual parents talk about the effects on their children, and they have homosexual parents find other parents that they know. This is not exactly a scientific way to conduct a study. And, uh, Completely against what you said about the Shercat uh, audit, uh, although Shercat himself has, does not have kind things to say about the study, he does say that the proper procedures were generally followed, uh, and, and they were. And you ask, why aren't there more studies like this? Well, take a look around. What folks are doing is trying to destroy Mark Regneros because he had the audacity to do a study in which he challenged conventional uh, thinking. He obeyed uh, proper scientific method uh, and he came to a different conclusion. And instead of then arguing about the conclusion, we actually have scholars trying to get him fired. Everyone knows that it's the case that if you stick your head up in academia or in much of elite culture and say, I believe marriage is the union of a man and a woman, or have evidence that shows that children do best with both mothers and fathers, that you are going to face a massive amount of pushback. You are going to be targeted. And again, attempts to say that our beliefs are the equivalent of hatred or bigotry or that we are poisoning people or we are trying to hurt people or we are trying to kill people as some uh, have said on the other side, I, I receive emails from folks all of the time, that is unacceptable in our civil discourse. We have never said anything like that. I have uh, always, and Nam has always, condemned violence or hatred of any kind towards anyone, on our side or your side. It, it, it has no place in this debate. But that really isn't the question, is it? The question is, is this idea that cultures throughout human history have shared that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, and that this is a unique and special union. And it isn't only religion that states this, because marriage is pre-political. It isn't the state that creates marriage. Uh, a, and different religions of very different ideas about public morality all share this understanding of marriage. Is this very idea that there's something unique about men and women, there's something unique about marriage between men and women, that this union is important for society, important for children, it's in the best interest of children, is simply saying that now somehow hateful, somehow bigoted, somehow harmful. The fact that some people don't want to hear that, and again, I'm in your home right now, I'm stating my, my beliefs, I'm not doing it in a way where I'm attempting to attack you. I'm saying what, what as far, uh, what the truth is and what, what our faith has taught, other faiths have taught, and what, frankly, people of no faith can come to through natural law. The simple idea that marriage is the union of a man and a woman. And you say, well, we don't want to change your institution. We want to be a part of it. There are two ideas on the table in this debate and what happened to these, these kids in this assembly and other, other uh, uh, attempts to label our side as hateful and bigoted make clear the stakes. On one side is the idea that there's something unique and special about men and women coming together in marriage and no other union of whatever kind is, 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 is the same thing as marriage. There's something special and unique about marriage that's in the best interest of society and culture. 
And there's the second idea, and I hear it in what you were just saying, but it, it comes out more clearly in debates when I ask point blank um, the question to folks I'm debating with. And the idea is there is nothing uh, morally different between men and men, women and women, and men and women united together. They're all the same. And folks that think that there is, folks like me, uh, uh, people uh, you know, largely of, of uh, religious faith communities that because of their faith believe that this is the case, or, or people, again, who, who may not be because of religion believe that this is the case, that we are the equivalent of racists and bigots. This comes up time and time again, and frankly, I think it's wrong. I don't think it's based on the facts of the argument. I don't think that it furthers the argument. I, I, and I think that it does create this impasse. As far as the, the attack on Christianity, come on. I mean, anyone who saw that knows that that was completely unacceptable, Dan. I mean, saying that someone's religion is BS when my understanding is that you were not brought into that assembly to talk about that. That's, in fact, what the folks who who brought you on when they distanced your, themselves from your comments, that's what they said. You were not brought in to talk about the, the, uh, the Bible and Christianity, but you did so on your own. To have a bunch of high school students to, to, to attack their religious beliefs, even if you don't disagree with them, it's not appropriate. It doesn't show respect. Uh, again, I, I am a, a Catholic. I have evangelical friends. I have Orthodox Jewish friends. Your attack on, uh, on uh, the, the ritual code of the Old Testament, for example. I don't adhere to that. I have a particular view of the history of the church, but I have respect for my Orthodox Jewish friends who do. You say whole point blank, no one accepts this anymore. Well, there are plenty of Orthodox Jews that do, uh, except when you, you talk about not eating shellfish, shellfish or whatever else. As far as slavery goes, again, you're just completely wrong. Your, your interpretation of scripture, Sam Harris's interpretation of scripture is completely wrong. Uh, if you look at the societies and cultures in which uh, Jews lived, if you look at the Code of Hammurabi, for example, you see that a master over a slave had total control of life and death, could do anything at will, essentially. That is not the case in Judaism. Uh, is a certain form of slavery accepted? Yes. But if you move to the New Testament, this is much more like indentured servitude. People would sell themselves, essentially, into a, a, a period of indentured servitude, usually between six and seven years. And uh, then uh, they could be released, and they could get money for that. Now, this wasn't always the case. This is very complicated. Uh, David Brian Davis has written an excellent book. There are a number of historians that are secular historians that have written excellent books on the problem of slavery in Western culture. But to say point blank that the, that the Bible is a pro-slavery document is just point blank false. What you're essentially saying is your interpretation trumps that of Frederick Douglass of Harriet Beecher Stowe, of William Wilberforce, of William Lloyd Garrison, and all of the abolitionists who pointed directly to the, the, uh, the, ver the um, book of the Bible that you t attempt to justify this notion that the Bible is pro-slavery, Philemon, they all pointed to Philemon to say, look what Paul does. Paul tells Onesimus, uh, he tells Philemon to to take Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as a brother, a dear brother in Christ. And this gets to the heart of, of what Christianity is to the world and Christianity's view on traditional sexual morality. Christianity is, if anything, radical. It's radical in its view of human dignity, of the human dignity of each and every one of us. The reason I'm here is because I, I believe in your human dignity. I believe in your human dignity. I'm willing to come and argue with you because of my respect for you. This notion of equality before God, of us all having this dignity before God, is key to the scriptures. And deep-seated within the New Testament, which was to come out uh, in Eugene the Fourth's condemnation of the slave trade, uh, in the, the current uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, condemnation, condemnation of slavery in the work of the abolitionists and William Wilberforce is this radical dignity of human beings. But this call that we have to live out the gospel message of love, of creating a civilization of love, is not at odds with my, uh, our idea of marriage. Scripture begins with a marriage. Its middle point is the wedding feast at Cana, and it ends with the wedding feast of the Lamb. The notion of the uniqueness of men and women is not some side thing 
in Scripture, it's a key part of our view of humanity, that there are two halves of humanity, male and female, and that we complement each other. And that complementarity bears fruit in children, can bear fruit in children, and that even without children, that the unitive nature of marriage brings together the two great halves of humanity. This is not something that we will ever discard. We will always have this view. There will be Christians who always stand up for, for this view. Um, and, they, and they don't do so, in my view, overwhelmingly because of any animus or hatred. They do so because they believe that this is true. They believe that faith and reason are not at odds here, that Scripture reinforces something that's true about human nature and good and beautiful. What I see uh, attempted here uh, and sometimes in, in other things that you've said that, are, that, I, that I think are much more colorful than what you just laid out, is, is the notion that we are deserving, that those of us who, who know that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, that, that we are deserving of treatment uh, less than others because we are, we are bigots and we deserve what we get. Uh, and I don't think that's true, and I don't think that helps further the debate, and I think that the attack on Christianity, as I said, uh, earlier, um, I, I don't. I don't think that people look at that and say, "Hey, you know, Dan Savage has a point." If anything, it it makes people say, "Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? This doesn't further your argument." Um, so I, I don't think it furthers your argument, and I think it's wrong. How much time do I have left? Uh, about two minutes left. Yeah. The other the other uh, point that that I think needs to be made is that. This is not just Catholics, this is not just evangelical Christians, this is not just Orthodox Jews. That, that people outside of faith traditions, as I said earlier, still understand the uniqueness of marriage. And that if you point to me people who are saying, and I've done this before, people that are using uh, reason to get to ends of attacking gays, I will be the first to condemn it. I've done it time and time again. If you, but I don't accept, no, I don't accept that that someone uh, having a differing opinion, a different, different analysis of science, what you just laid out about Mar Mark Regneros, that somehow because uh, his science doesn't agree with the, uh, the argument that you've put forward, that the APA has put forward, that somehow there, there's, a, there's a right to demonize or attack him. I think it's wrong. Um, and you know, I think that if we want to have a debate, let's do it civilly, let's do it based upon as I say, looking at the best, best scripture um, scholars. Sam Harris is not one of the best scripture scholars. It's just wrong. Doesn't even pay attention to, 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 to the abolitionist argument. You just act like they don't exist. It's wrong. So let's have a civil debate. Let's base it upon facts, not innuendo. And if we do that, I'm firmly convinced that, uh, that folks will not somehow move to supporting same-sex marriage. I think that uh, what you'll see is that people will understand that folks like me have a reasoned point, uh, then that reason and faith are not necessarily at odds. May I respond? Five minutes. Um, for, you yeah. know, uh, you, you, people can conclude that same-sex marriage is wrong and then they're free not to enter into same-sex marriages. If you conclude that same-sex marriages are wrong because of your faith, you don't have a right to impose that limitation on other people who happen to disagree with you. And there are other Christian uh, Christians, Christian denominations, Christian pastors who would uh, like to legally marry people as your church can legally marry people and it's a denial of their religious freedom to deny them that right. Mark Regnerus is not in trouble for his conclusions. He's in trouble for his uh, methodology which was cooked and he is in trouble because his study didn't study what he claimed it studied, not because of the findings. If somebody rolled out a rock-solid study that showed that gay parents were less good for kids than straight parents that was unassailable science and repl replicable science, there wouldn't really be an argument about that study. Mark Regnerus is in trouble because his study is corrupt. As for the FRC being labeled a hate group by the, by the Southern Poverty Law Center, it's not because they're pro-family, it's not because they're even anti-gay marriage. The Boy Scouts are anti-gay marriage, the Catholic Church is anti-gay marriage, has not been so labeled. It's been labeled thusly for things like a publication called Homosexual Activists Work to Normalize Sex with Boys, put out by the Family Research Council that states, 
One of the primary goals of the homosexual rights movement is to abolish all age of consent laws and to eventually recognize pedophiles as the prophets of a new sexual order. Homosexual activists publicly disassociate themselves from pedophiles as a part of this public relations strategy. That is why they've been labeled a hate group, not because they're for a limited definition of marriage that excludes gay people. Um, you know, there's been a lot of writing about my speech after the, like, the shit storm because I said the word bullshit. Um, uh, there's been a lot of writing uh, after the fact with uh, Christian writers, thoughtful Christian writers, admitting that I am right. I was not attacking Christianity. I didn't say Christianity is bullshit. I said there is bullshit in the Bible. I was talking about selective literal readings of the Bible. People who reach into Leviticus and say, we as modern, a man shall not lie with a man as he lies with a woman. But then ignore Deuteronomy, a woman who is not a virgin on her wedding night must be stoned to death at her father's doorstep. If Leviticus is in force, why isn't Deuteronomy? If we hear about the abomination that is a man lying with a man, we never hear about the hundred plus other things that are labeled abominations in the Old Testament. And why not? Why this selective cherry picking just to attack gay people, to justify really anti-gay bigotry? And I'm sorry there's no other word for it. I don't think that opposition, principled opposition to same-sex marriage is necessarily bigotry. That is bigotry. What the Family Research Council has put out there is unquestionable bigotry, which is why they were labeled a hate group, not by gay land, not by me, but by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And, you know, there's this argument on your side that we want to change the institution of marriage. Do I have any time left? Yeah, yeah, take a couple more, two um, minutes. We don't want to change the institution of marriage. The fact of the matter is uh, heterosexuals have changed the institution of marriage. Marriage for most of recorded human history was polygamous. Marriage for most of recorded human history was a property transaction where one man took possession of another man's daughter and, and during that property transaction she became a wife. Um, men had, uh, and this was the case for many, many centuries. And about 100 years ago, we began to redefine marriage to be an egalitarian institution where two people create each other as their next of kin through marriage. Um, and it's not a gendered institution anymore. It's not about babies. It's about commitment and love. It's about establishing that next of kin. It's about finding that one person in the world to be there for you, who you will be for be there for. Um, and marriage just isn't defined by sex roles anymore or the presence of children. The only time we hear that marriage is defined by children or monogamy or faith is when gay people want to get married. Suddenly marriage is defined by children when gay people want to get married. You just had dinner with my son. We have children. Gay people have children. Uh, adoptions by same-sex couples over the last 10 years have tripled in the United States. Um, if marriage is about children and the state made us DJ's parents, why won't the state then give us a civil marriage, not a religious ceremony, but a civil marriage license that give, affords us the same rights, responsibilities that any other straight couple that the state gave children to and made parents, legal parents, would be afforded. This is an attack on anyone's faith. Legal civil marriage doesn't require anybody's church to approve or officiate or accommodate married same-sex couples. It takes nothing from you or your definition of marriage for the institution of marriage as straight people currently define it and practice it to be open to accommodate us as well. We are three-ish percent of the population. We are not going to decenter what it means to be a man and a woman from what it means to be married by allowing same-sex couples to marry. If anything, it affirms the original sort of understanding of marriage and its importance, particularly for family life, to bring us into that order. Do you want to take that? Yeah, uh, you know, again, uh, you're saying what you want to be true, but is not in fact true. Of course it is true that by changing the fundamental nature of marriage, the fundamental nature of marriage, regardless of what any religious institution, regardless of what the state says, by its very definition, marriage is the union of a man and a woman. Because only this type of union can bring into society new life and connect that new life with both a mother and a father. Now saying that somehow that's completely gone because of the 60s is wrong. I didn't Her say that. Well, you no, know, you said heterosexuals have already changed the definition of marriage. You've so redefined marriage. No, it, we have not. Do straight of people who get married have to have babies or they're suddenly they, not married? Of course they don't, right. but they never did. 
They never did. The, the notion, the simplistic notion that because parenthood is connected with marriage, because marriage is that institution by which society connects children to their biological mothers and fathers, the simplistic idea that somehow that means what we're saying is that every single person has to have a child, that's silly. We never claim that. Marriage is the institution that does this. Two men and two women cannot naturally have their own children. There is a mother or father somewhere. Marriage is the institution that connects that child to both their mother and father. And that's why the state is interested in marriage. Because marriage is the institution that allows children to know both their mother and father. So to say that somehow changing the definition of marriage will have no effect, will have no effect, is simply wrong. There are two ideas on the table. Only one idea can stand. One idea is the marriage idea. The, the idea that's been shared, as I said before, by many different cultures over great expanses of time and place. And that is there's something special and unique about men and women coming together in marriage. And that society has an interest in uplifting this special and unique institution. And that only this is a marriage. The same-sex marriage idea is that that is wrong and that those of us who don't agree are the equivalent of bigots. You put that in the law and don't come back and say, oh, we're surprised that now we're, we're, we're closing down Catholic Charities Adoption Agency in Massachusetts because it won't adopt kids to same-sex couples. We're surprised that we're removing the tax exemption from Ocean Grove Methodist Association because they won't allow a part of their property be, to be used for a civil union ceremony. We're surprised that the Knights of Columbus are now being uh, a find for not allowing their halls to be used for same-sex marriages. Why would you not do that? If your new idea of marriage is encoded into the law, it will be used to rep uh, repress, marginalize, and punish those of us who believe that marriage is the union of a man and a woman and will act on it. That is what will happen. And uh, the, the second point of what you just said, again, being, in my view, quite dismissive of the overwhelming majority of biblical scholars saying that a few scholars say that what you've just laid out is is true is not an argument the overwhelming majority of biblical scholars whether catholic or evangelical or secular understand that at the council of jerusalem in 50 a.d the questions that you're laying out like why don't we accept the dietary and ritual restrictions of the old testament why don't we accept that in the New Testament? Well, that was sorted out at the Council of Jerusalem. Most of it was. And the reality was that there was a big fight. There was a fight with Judaizers, Marcion, who attempted to say that that old uh, Jewish God is a different God. It's totally different. There was a, th this, this battle was waged, not a real battle, but an intellectual battle for, for quite a while. At the, at the end, it was very clear that, as the Council of Jerusalem said, that Christians did not need to follow all of the Jewish laws, that Christ came to, to consummate, right. to be at the that fulfillment. But what, but what you fail to, to distinguish is that the, the church's position on homosexuality was at no point, at no point contested, that there is not an attempt, a, the same sort of argument over what everyone, the Essenes, Jews, Christians, everyone accepted as the, the truth about human sexuality, that male and female he made them, that this is a special and re unique relationship. This is not contested. It's only in recent years that there have been those who want to claim and rewrite scripture to say that traditional sexual, tr traditional sexual morality is optional. But just be because you believe in traditional sexual morality does not then mean that somehow you're hateful or bigoted uh, I'm here. I'm here to debate you. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm a, I, I, I hate you or dislike you. Okay, so Go ahead. May I stop you there? Mm -hmm. That's that's so it's about. <laughs> we'll stop you there. So I'd like to interject with a couple questions. Well, have, oh, you're all right. Oh, all right, respond. you take a quick response. Then do I get a response? You guys can talk to each other. <laughs> well, I have some the questions. The point you made earlier about the abolitionists, the fact that you can make an argument from the Bible that is pro-slavery or anti-slavery doesn't prove the Bible got slavery right. It proves the Bible is very malleable and you can mine it for either side, including people who mine the Bible for now both sides of the debate about homosexuality. But that wasn't about what you claimed, Dan. That yes, it was claimed. my point. You claimed that the Bible is a radically well, pro-slavery document. Jew, as the and Jew here, is. could I say something as the Jew, as the house Jew? Yes. Right. <laughs> you, right. Christians long ago, I, I want to I accede to your point. Christians long ago decided that most of the rules in the Old Testament are not applicable to them. You don't have to listen to them, right? So I don't eat pork, but you do. 
because your people decided, was it at the Council of Jerusalem or was it, I mean, this happened yes, in various yeah, stages. 50. We don't have to listen to that law. It's as clear in Deuteronomy as, but that, but that, as wait, 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 let me finish. Okay. Wait, let me finish. As are some other laws about things like a man lying with a man, as are some other laws about which fibers you can mix together in your clothes. Right? But basically, the, New, the Old Testament is not controlling what we would call the Hebrew Bible, isn't controlling for your theology. So we can set, well, that, I mean, you would generally set it true. aside. No, that's not true. What you say is set aside. Christianity is the consummation. I understand. In our view. We're not setting aside. But there certain are certain the, things. Certain rules got kept well, and certain ones got Jesus lost. Jesus himself says, Christ himself says, right. why, did, why do you, did you allow a, a divorce? Why was divorce allowed? Christ turns around and right. says, uh, this was allowed because of hardness of heart. So it's clear right in the New Testament that it isn't everything that's being uh, swept right. away. It's that it's being consummated in a new law, a new covenant. Right. I understand. When the new law and the new covenant was consummated, certain rules that my people take very seriously, like mm -hmm. not eating a lamb and its mother, a kid in its mother's milk, right, because that's disrespectful mm -hmm. to the animal, like not eating shellfish, uh, etc., don't matter to you anymore as a Christian and didn't matter to your father and mother, right? They, just, they don't count, okay? Other laws got kept. The rationale for which ones were kept and which ones weren't are not immediately apparent to a Hebrew such as me, right? Mm -hmm. But so when you look to, to just, let me finish. Mm -hmm. When you look to, to justify certain prohibitions on homosexuality, it makes much more sense to look to the New Testament. I just want to take Dan's point there and say, but the New Testament did get slavery wrong. It's an extent, yes, it wasn't exactly the same kind of slavery, but it's an eccentric no. reading of it to say that it doesn't say it's slaves not obey your masters. It's not eccentric at all. But what's more, obey what's your more, masters me, is if they're let me, Christ. Let me one more thing. Let me say one more thing to the to the Catholic convert here, right? You find divorce. Divorce is not permitted in Catholicism, right? But I don't. It's not my understanding that the National Organization for Marriage is pushing as hard to at all. prohibit divorce, civil divorce, as you are to prohibit civil marriage of gay people, right? All I'm saying, the only point I'm making here, as the one who finished his degree in religion and who was a student of David Brian Davis, okay? Mm -hmm. The only point I'm making here is, I don't think it's reasonable to say that there aren't specific emphases that get placed on different things at different points in time. So for example, I don't see you putting money and lobbying efforts towards eliminating the, the, the permissibility of divorce. Well, of course not. Look, we are the only... Because that would touch on the rights of straight no, people. No, it has nothing to do with that. We because then the you'd be attacking the rights of the majority and talking, not a tiny talking defenseless over, minority. Over someone is not an argument. No, no, no go ahead. Uh, we are the only group that is focusing on this last uh, step to to permanently alter and fundamentally undermine the nature of marriage, which is to radically redefine it. There is no question that the no-fault divorce revolution and the notion that marriage is predominantly about me, uh, that, that marriage is about the self-fulfillment of adults, not the lived needs of children, there is no question that that is what got us to this point. But to say that we've what, chosen to focus on this one issue, well, can I just ask? And 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 then you decide. Well, you know that's not as important as no, no, feeding no. the poor or. I, of I'm not, not. I'm agnostic. I'm just asking because I know you're a Roman Catholic and I'm I'm a student no. and a journalist of this stuff. Are you, for example, in favor of making divorce illegal mm -hmm. again? No, you, because you believe just, something is wrong doesn't mean you make it illegal. This then is why not, not but the same is, policy towards but civil gay marriages? Again, there's a misunderstanding here. The gay marriage cannot exist. There cannot be a marriage of two men or two women. It just because in the state, and Spain. Just because the state says it so, this is not based upon reality. Well, marriage by, you can call a cat a dog in the law, but a cat does not become a dog. Marriage is by its definition, it is intrinsically something. It is not simply about your desires. It is not about my desires. So, so marriage to, is a civil, a package of civil rights and legal responsibilities, no longer for any two people. Or one, what about three people or four? The merits of polygamy, and you know, if you want to ban polygamy, po most polygamous marriages have been heterosexual. So if you're worried about the slippery slope, it's heterosexual marriage that puts it, it, us on the slippery it, it slope I'm not, I'm not making a slippery slope argument here. I'm making an argument based upon logic. I'm saying if your argument is that you want the rights, benefits, and privileges of marriage, and therefore you deserve them and, and I want equal have protection them, under the law. Then why should not someone who wants to marry three, four, or five people? Equal protection under the law. Everyone has a right to marry. Everyone who's straight has a right to marry someone. Right now, as a gay person, I have a right to marry well, no one. Well, what, what about the right of the person who believes that uh, they, they're in love with two, three, or four people? Jonathan Roche makes a great argument against polygamous marriages well, because they do actual harm, because high-status men then collect 
dozens oh, or hundreds of wives is, like David like in the, the Bible, like Solomon in the Bible. Me. This is the same. No, I just no. This is un, it's unfair to say to a gay marriage advocate that then we have to make the defense for polygamous marriage or multiple no. marriage when that's not my argument or my fight. Well, Let the polygamists make well, that argument. And those polygamists are all straight. Okay, but just because there it's are no not gay people argument, out there making an argument for polygamous just, marriage. Just because it's not your argument doesn't mean that it naturally follows. If marriage is based primarily about the wishes and the of the self fulfillment of adults. And if the adult definition of marriage and desire for it produces this right, then why doesn't someone have the right to marry two, three, or four people? This, the reason I bring up this point is not because it's going to happen tomorrow. The reason I bring up this point is because if marriage is not intrinsically about bringing the two sexes together, if it is not, that is not what it is. And once you go off into this other area, then you have completely destroyed marriage because it is whatever you want it to be. Can I, has polygamous marriage come to Canada, which has had same-sex marriage? Oh, there's for a ten push years? for polyamory. Okay, so Judith Stacy and a number of scholars mm -hmm. wrote a whole piece on beyond gay marriage. So let me let me interrupt this. and say I think well, the answer to, I think the answer to that, as someone with with you know who's married and not gay, and has no <laughs> dog in this fight particularly, um, I think the answer to that might be that the government should evaluate what's good public policy, empirically speaking, right? I, I know that neither of you will Which see that. Which is Jonathan Roche's argument. So let me, let me say I think that, that that could end up with bad answers for both of you. In principle, it could. It might not, but in principle, it could. So I actually want to ask each of you, is there any evidence, right? This, so this is Karl Popper's test of falsifiability, right? If you're making an honest argument, one with integrity, then presumably, if it's based on evidence rather than just ideology, right? Presumably, some evidence could come along that would make you change your mind. And when I asked Maggie Gallagher this question, your ally, right, I said, could any evidence come along that would make you say gay marriage is a good idea? She basically said, she said such evidence exists, but it would be so hard to ascertain that I can't reasonably think I'll ever see it, right? She basically said no. She will believe what she believes no matter what the evidence is. Um, she, she can defend herself on her blog if I've misunderstood that. I'm trying to be fair to Maggie, whom I, whom I do uh, think is a, you know, an honest dealer, right? I'd like to ask each of you, is there any evidence that could come along? What evidence would make you change your mind about anything? It could be gay marriage. It could be uh, the status of homosexuals in society. Is there a piece of evidence that you could see, for example, that in fact gay marriage or, or children being raised by gay couples turns out badly for the children on average? Or for example, that it turns out well for them on, 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 on average, right? Could you see the evidence that would make you alter your position in, in some way? Can I go first? Dan. Um, if marriage, if, if same-sex marriage, you know, in Canada somehow slid towards people marrying their horses, which is a pamphlet the Family Research Council put out comparing same-sex marriage to people marrying animals, um, or child rape, or other things that I find um, morally outrageous and offensive, that might change my position on same-sex marriage. Um, the idea, though, that same-sex marriage is harming children, um, the choice isn't for kids like my son DJ between straight couples and gay couples. There are more children out there who need to be adopted than there are families to take them. The choice literally for our son was me and Terry or no one. Terry, uh, DJ's birth mother was nine, eight, eight and a half months pregnant. She had approached two heterosexual couples who turned her down. There were three straight couples that failed DJ before he was adopted by Terry and I. Even if there was social science showing that the outcomes for children were less optimal with a same-sex couple as parents. A same-sex couple as parents is still more optimal, is still a better thing for a child than no parents at all, or bouncing around foster care, being abused, physically abused. Um, so, I mean, that, that's my answer to your question. Uh, you know, you're such a Gatling gun of examples. I do have to throw out the Ocean Grove Camp Meeting Association, which you threw out as an example of gay people, uh, legal gay marriage somehow oppressing uh, people of faith. Uh, that was in New Jersey, where there is no, uh, no right to same-sex marriage. There are civil unions. Um, this isn't about discrimination. It's about discrimination law. They had a tax-exempt status for this pavilion. This lesbian couple wanted to use the pavilion for their civil union ceremony. Um, the tax-exempt status that the church had filed for didn't allow them to discriminate against them. It had to be open to the general public. They lost that tax-exempt status for the pavilion. The state helped them file for the correct tax-exempt status, which is a religious organization tax-exempt status. And now they have their tax-exempt status for the pavilion, and they can exclude anyone that they like. The outcome for the Ocean Grove Camp Meeting Association was positive. Those lesbians did them a favor 
by attempting to rent that thing because it identified that they'd filed for the wrong tax exemption. I, I cannot. So that, was, is, so that is, was two minutes. It is false I, witness. Yeah. No, for I don't, no, it isn't. That so wait, no, it's completely you wrong. You can take two minutes, but in that time, I want you to tell me what evidence would make you change your well, position. Well, first, in some I have way. to answer this. I mean, again, David, David in your two you're, minutes. You're, just, you're just wrong on this. Look, for two years, you have a, a, a religious organization that loses part of its ta state tax exempt status. And then you say, because it took two extra years more, no harm, no foul. In fact, things are better. Wrong. That's completely wrong. And you, you fail to bring up, obviously, Massachusetts uh, Catholic Charities or some of the other examples because... I you, can address that no, too. I was right. just it's his two minutes. No, it's his two no, minutes. No, because, because everyone... Google it. Google it. Google ev all please Google it. Every, have been yeah, no, they have not been debunked at all because what people will claim is that this is because of, because of discrimination law. Well, of course, if the state incorporates your new, new idea of same-sex marriage, then discrimination law's tentacles go much, Only much if further. Only you're taking state money. You can't take hear. state money oh, and discriminate. Dan is again... Please. The Mormon charities I, I, in no, Massachusetts. You, got, you have to let me. One more time. Let, you, you, you have to let me respond and at least clarify simple point here. blank untruths. It is untruth. It is a simple untruth, and anyone can look it up. That the reason Massachusetts Boston Catholic Charities lost its tax exempt status was because it was taking state money. That is verifiably point blank false. That was not the reason the state gave. The state said you are discriminating by not placing kids with same-sex couples. It has nothing to do with state money. So that, that is just wrong. Can, can, can I just ask, I do want to say, to keep just us on like time, close up of the is notes. there any evidence that could come that would cause you to change your positions in any way? Well, I disagree with your, your, um, your experiential Karl Pop, Popper analysis in the first place okay. uh, with something like this, because this is an area of first principle. This is an area of, of, of basic reason. It would be like saying, would, would you find evidence it, it, what would convince you that a square could be a circle? Okay, I, okay. So I just want to be clear on <laughs> yeah. that. Even if, and, and I'm not, I'm not mocking your position at all. I want to be clear. Even if 50 years from now, when a certain number of states have had same-sex marriage and have had children raised by same-sex couples and civil, et cetera, et cetera, we have some. Th Logically speaking, a body of reasonable social science could exist that shows that these children are well raised and I happy. In principle, it could even show they're happier. I'm not saying there's any reason they would be, but in principle, logically, it could show that you still wouldn't change your position. It, I, I wouldn't change the idea that there's something fundamentally real about marriage okay. as the union a of a thousand man and a woman. years worth of that kind Allowing of evidence. Allowing same-sex couples would, to marry doesn't take anything away from it. Does it wait, that understanding of what, marriage? I just so I just want. Again, I just we disagree on this, Dan. I think it, it, it clearly does. It does take what, away. What does it? What does it take away? Well, because it, if I'm married too, it somehow so diminishes let me add, your actually, opposite sex marriage. I think, in principle, there could be harms. I'd like to know what they oh, would be. Oh, the, the harms are very clear. I laid out some of them. When you change the definition of marriage, you don't just uh, change it for Dan. Uh, you change it for everyone. You change the public policy, the public understanding okay, so of marriage. So what's the fallout from uh, that? The fallout from that is everything from schools, what's taught to our children in schools. Our, our kids are taught that it's the same thing for Mary to grow up and marry a girl as to marry a boy. Same for, for Johnny. Mm -hmm. And that those of us who think differently are essentially bigots. Okay, but aside, from, so, so you've, you've, I think, established your belief that there would be extra opprobrium against people who believe differently. But would anyone's marriages be worse? Well, I think it damages... I think it fundamentally damages the institution to to take something that is not a marriage, and then to say it is. D damages how? I mean, again, I just want. But that, I'm an empiricist here. Damages how? Will there be? Will more marriages fail? Will fewer marriages happen? If you, what's the empirical fallout you're the, predicting? Because we're going down this road. You don't. You don't want. I. I don't actually well, think we are going. If down we this go road. down this road, <laughs> well, we are so going far, down this road. Let me put Empirically speaking, in the last ten years, we moved some piece down this I, road. What's I, the fallout from that? I, I think, again, 32 of 32 states have voted to protect I, marriage. I got the talking points. Yeah. But there are more states but now that have gay marriage than 10 years but, ago. What's the fallout you predict from that? Well, the fallout I've already laid out to you. You don't, you don't like the arguments. No, is there but, fallout in people's marriages? I understand there's fallout in that you'll be called a bigot. And you will be. I understand. Is there fallout well, It's in not just we'll be called marriages? a bigot. It's that the, the, whole, the whole notion of this good, true, and beautiful thing that is marriage the union of a man and a woman. We will have our public culture and law saying that that good, true, and beautiful thing is not true. Right. And that our How is it going to say that when 97, roughly, no, over 90% of all marriages are still going to be opposite sex marriages, it, it, even if gay people can get it married? It doesn't matter. In New York and in other states, you have not seen large numbers of same-sex marriages, but you've still seen uh, justices of the, of the peace. 
uh, told they can no longer have their job. You are still state seen, employees. Well, again, with a and, you state think, function. and you think, do you think this a justice is fine. Of, do you think a justice of the peace on belief on faith grounds should be able to deny? A marriage license, signing a marriage license for an interfaith couple because it violates their religious principles. Of course principles. not, and, and I don't think that it should happen for uh, interracial marriages either. But those are totally different things. Again, you're comparing apples to oranges. Uh, comparing one kind of discrimination to another kind. No, of it isn't discrimination. That's where we disagree. If it was discrimination, I would support your position. It's not discrimination it to discrimination. call an apple an apple it's and an orange an orange. Between two different kinds of couples based on no, the gender then, then, orientations of those couples. Then I can have the same argument, what I laid out earlier. Why are you not discriminating against folks who believe that they can marry two, three, or four people? This whole discrimination language is false because before you ever get to this point, you have to show that somehow it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Unions of two men and two women are not the same. Because They're, they can't produce a child. Well, that's one very very that's the ones clear that reality. Keep hammering away at. Well, they also don't bring the two halves of humanity together. We believe, I believe, there's something important in that union that that there are two halves of humanity. Bringing those two halves together in in a faithful, uh, committed, monogamous relationship is very, very so important. I, Lyle Menendez, wait, one of the two we'll Menendez brothers over. who murdered <laughs> Lyle Menendez, one of the two Menendez brothers who murdered their parents, is legally married got married. They'll never consummate this marriage. They will never have children. You will never bring those two halves of humanity together in the Menendez marriage because Lyle Menendez is going to be in prison for the rest of his life without the possibility of parole. Lyle Menendez can marry and that does no harm to marriage. But somehow allowing Terry and I to marry the parents well, of that child that you had dinner with is going to do irrevocable harm to marriage as an institution. How? Traditionally, consummation was a part of marriage throughout Western okay, so law. Let me end with this. I'd actually like to know. How does the Menendez marriage not harm? Well, 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 again, you can create any example. You can bring up any example of folks who've been divorced four or five times. You can cr create this Lyle Menendez example. I didn't it has, create it. Well, but it has absolutely no bearing to the fundamental question of what is marriage. Wait, can I? Marriage is by its nature the conjugal union of one man and one woman. Just because heterosexuals betray uh, fidelity, the uh, betray uh, anything uh, Historically, that, that marriage has, more marriages have been polygamous than any other form well, that, again, over the course of human history. So this one man, one woman thing is a misnomer and is not biblical. Oh, well, How many wives did Solomon have? How many wives did David have? So you just only accept part of the New Testament, by the t uh, Old Testament. By the time of the New Testament, polygamy was basically gone. Your, your history is wrong because you say the whole Bible accepts I said polygamy. the Old Testament. No, you said, you said the Bible. Okay, but, so but we're going to take one more minute and I'm going to pose the question. <laughs> I'm going to pose the question, which is, I'd like to know, you just get one minute and then we'll, and then we'll stop. Oh my God. I'd, I'd like, because it's an hour's stop. I feel like we're just getting started. And then, we'll, and then we'll stay and we'll just like pummel each other. He's going to take me out back. And so no, here's, the question out loud. here's the question I have, which is, and you have one minute each, and I think that's enough time. What kind of marriage regime do you endorse? If you could create the law from scratch, and I want to know from you, why wouldn't polygamy be allowed, right? What regime are you going to create, and why would you include what you'd include and exclude what you include? And what marriage regime would you create, including would divorce be permissible, et cetera, et cetera? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Again, we're all talking the realm of ideal. None of us is controlling history here. But I'd like to know if you were counseling people on what kind of laws to make in an ideal world, what would the regime look like? Dan, do you want to go first? Marriage is the legal union of two adults and, and that's what i think it should be and i believe it should be limited to that i think john i, I can't paraphrase uh jonathan roche's argument against uh polygamy but i think polygamy fails on its merits um, because polygamy is tied to a class structure that uh, is destabilizing that uh, creates scores of unmarriageable men polygamy is always one man with many many wives how many wives did donald trump have uh if polygamy was legal and possible for donald trump probably countless at this point um, and when one man has 30 wives, 10 wives, there's another man who has, there's, there's nine men who have no wives when one man has 10 wives. And that's destabilizing to society and it fails on its merits for the harm that it does. Same-sex marriage does no harm, does not fail on the merits of doing harm to other people. Um, the only way gay people harm people when they marry is when gay people marry straight people, which is the religious rights prescription for us. We're not supposed to be gay, we're supposed to be ex-gay and marry women and fake it. Um, and that is, if anyone goes to the Straight Spouse Network, uh, and reads about the damage done when gay people enter into opposite sex marriages, uh, unworkable. Um, I think marriage is the legal union of two adults. Um, marriage should not be incestuous. Uh, 
And I, I don't believe that it should be poly polygamous either. And I don't know any gay person who does. And I know there's some radical uh, writers and thinkers out there, but you can't pen me with them just because uh, I'm for same-sex marriage and so are they plus a whole lot else. Okay. What, what, what would your marriage regime look like? Yeah, the, the question obviously is not um, whether or not Dan supports uh, uh, polyamory or polygamy or multiple uh, marriages. It's not the question. The question is, by what reason do you not? And I don't think Jonathan Rauch's argument holds water. If you fundamentally torn away the fundamental, the, the nature of what marriage is, as the union of a man and a woman, based on their complementarity, based on the ability to have children, the connection between parenthood, that they could have children even if they don't. Once you do away with that and you make it only about adult desires, then I'm not even talking about polygamy. What about three men? What about whatever you want? This is not does not mean that I'm saying this is going to happen tomorrow. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying by what reason do you oppose it? And I don't think there is a reason. As far as an ideal marriage regime, I think uh, marriage in America before the no-fault uh, divorce revolution, as far as the legal structure. Now again, there's no period at which everything is perfect. Things can always be better. But uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the reason we're even debating this topic, the reason this topic really doesn't come up until quite recently is because only in a society that has, has lost the conception of marriage as being intricately tied to parenthood and children about children's real needs rather than adult desires, only at that point do we see Western cultures especially embracing this new notion of marriage where it could actually be same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you, you brought up the issue of divorce. Uh, do I believe in divorce? No. Uh, Aquinas says that, that you know, there are obviously laws have to fit a certain culture and a culture with widespread divorce trying to make something you know, illegal is wrong, but I think we should make it a lot more difficult. I think that no-fault divorce should go, go away uh, and that, that this, the gold standard for public policy should be that marriage is the lifelong commitment of one man and one woman. Okay. Well, we'll hang out for a while and keep talking. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so the dinner table is closed. <laughs>